of Management Practice at London Business School and uh, also the founder of HSM Advisory. I've written a number of books, two of them with Andrew Scott, The Hundred Year Life and The New Long Life. And what I want to talk about today is why I think even though we're in the midst of a pandemic and people are rightly concerned about health and mortality, I think that we still need to focus on the uh, area that we, Andrew and I talked about, the 100 year life. Here's why. You know, when you think that you're going to live to 100, as is going to be increasingly the case for people around the world. So right now, uh, every decade, people live for two years longer. Now you might think, well, how long could we live? I'm not an expert in that. But certainly I think it's reasonable to assume that uh, your children could well live to 100. And it may be that even you could have those 100 candles on your birthday cake. Now, what happens when not just you, but tens of millions of people around the world live into their 80s and, the, and their 90s? And I want to talk about what that means and also the profound impact that's going to have on our society. Well, the marvel about working with an economist, I'm a psychologist, is that Andrew looked at the economics of living into your 90s. And the good news is, you'll be working into your mid seventies. This has not been great for me because frankly at 66, I thought I might be able to shuffle gracefully into retirement. But sadly, uh, because I've told everybody else they have to work until their mid seventies, here I am. In fact, I've just finished a new book, Redesigning Work, that you'll see in March, 2022. Um, so we're gonna be living into our seventies, unless that is, uh, you've saved a great deal of money. And let's face it, most of us haven't. So that's going to become the norm. Now, on the face of it, that you may say, well, hang on, you know, what does that mean for me and corporations? That seems a very long working life. And it seems a long life. But one thing to remember is that how you age is malleable. You may think it's to do with your DNA. Perhaps your dad or mum was ill at an early age. You think you're going to be, but that's not the case. In fact, actually, uh, how we live, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later, is really important to how we age. And so if we live healthily, and we all know what we have to do to live healthily, we have to exercise, uh, we have to eat healthily, and we need to have eight hours sleep. Everybody knows that, we may decide not to do it, but we all know what it is to live, to live a healthy life. And if you do that, you're more likely to live healthily into your 80s and your 90s. Now, what does that mean to the way we think about our lives? What does it mean for the corporations that we work with? Well, I think it's going to have a profound impact on our narrative, you know, just the way we think about lives. If you think you're going to die at 60, then obviously, as you look forward, there isn't really a great deal of space to do all sorts of exciting things. But suddenly, as your life expands, uh, then there's more space to do things. And that's why we're beginning to see people in their 60s and their 70s and 80s reinventing the way they think about life. But it's not just people over the, over the age of 50 who are doing that. For young people, if you think that you have a whole 100 years ahead of you, 80, 90 years ahead of you, you also have an opportunity to reinvent your life course. So as people are doing that, what are they thinking? Well, the most obvious thing is the traditional life course of full-time education, full-time work, full-time retirement is just not fit for purpose. Why? Well, I've talked about uh, the impact of longevity on, our, on the way we think about our narrative. But of course, at the same time, we're also living at a period of extraordinary technological change and of course huge changes to our climate and to how we're going to live our lives. Our lives, the world around us is going to change considerably during the course of our life and we have to be prepared to know what to do about that. And so the three-stage life is very, very inflexible. A, it, is, it assumes that 
you can just have one go at education at the beginning of your life. And somehow that's going to prepare you for the rest of your life when it's sort of obvious that as technology changes the way we work, as it as AI does more and more of the tasks that we do, we have to learn right the way through our lives. B, you know, if you now say that you're going to live to 100 and work until your mid 70s, even 80, that's a very long period of life, uh, of working life, particularly is if it's as inflexible it was as it as it as it was before the pandemic. I say that because, of course, the pandemic has significantly increased the flexibility of work, both in terms of place and in terms of time. Will we go back to where we were? I suspect not. And I think part of the great resignation we're seeing now is because people have begun to realize I can't work like I am. And I sort of could do it if you told me I could stop it at 60. But now you're telling me I have to do it to 75. Wow. I have to change the way that I that I that I work and and see when we think about retirement. Um, if you retire at 65 and live until you're 100. It's a long time on the golf course. So why wouldn't you want to redistribute some of the leisure time you thought you were having at the end of your life and bring it in to bring it back to the rest of your life? And similarly, why couldn't we risk redistribute some of the time we'd, we'd put aside for education at the beginning of our life and redistribute it so it goes right the way through our life? What I'm talking about in effect is a multi-stage life. And that's a very important concept because that's what, I, that's what Andrew Scott and I talked about in our books. And indeed, it's what I talk about in my new book, Redesigning Work. It's one of the forces that's going to really, uh, I think, make hybrid work very much more difficult to let go of than CEOs maybe hope. And I think it's going to fundamentally change the way that we work. Now, what do I mean by a multi-stage life? Well, first of all, it's a, it's a way of living across the, your, your whole life where you do more activities. What might they be? Well, for example, you might uh, take time off to travel the world, not just when you're 18 and doing your gap year, but really at any time. You might want to start a new business. Again, not in your early 20s, but maybe in your 50s. Um, you may want to do build a portfolio life. Again, you could do that at 30, not just when you're 60. You may want to really work in your community and do voluntary service. These are all activities that are now possible as our life extends. But one thing that's also really interesting about the difference between the uh, three-stage life and a multi-stage life is that in a three-stage life, uh, everybody does it at the same time. You know, if you're 20 and look around, you say, ah, I'm probably in, uh, coming out of education. If you're 40, you look around, you'll say, I'm probably working full time. If you're 65, you look around, you say, I'm probably now retired. Once you move to a multi-stage life, people actually go about those stages in a much more individualistic way. I, I just said a moment ago, you could actually do any of those stages at a different a, at a different time of your life. And that means that we're no longer in lockstep, where each generation, each age cohort, what steps together through their lives. Now, the, the marvel of lockstep is you didn't really have to have any personal agency you just had to look around at to, to what everybody else was doing and just do what they were doing. But once you have a, a multi-stage life, you have to create a great deal more personal agency. You have to learn, in other words, how to transform and how to take responsibility for your life. Again, part of the reason I think we have the big um, res resign right now is because people now have learned to do that and as we come, as we move out of the pandemic, they're thinking, well, I, I want a multi-stage life. I want more flexibility. And of course, in a multi-stage life, there are a lot more transitions. 
Uh, in, the, uh, in a three-stage life, there's only a couple of transitions. In a multi-stage life, you could be transitioning from having your own business to going back to work to, in a company full-time to doing part-time work and so on and so forth. So this is potentially a much more exciting way of living our lives. And I think that you're going to see more and more people doing that. So as we begin to think that we may be living into our hundreds, one of the implications of that is that we will move from a, uh, a three-stage life to a multi-stage life. But there's one more implication that I think is really important that I very just want to briefly touch on. And that's the concept of assets. Now, we can think about assets as tangible and intangible assets. Tangible assets are things like money, your pension, the, 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 the money that you have in your house and so on. And they're pretty fungible. You can buy and sell them at any point in time. And they're very useful for a long life. I, I'm certainly not suggesting that it's, uh, it, it's anything other than important to have those tangible assets. But it turns out that whilst tangible assets are important in a long life, they're not, they're necessary, but not sufficient. What really becomes ever more important is intangible assets. Uh, those things that money can't buy, that you develop over time, that aren't so easily fungible, that actually have to be, you have to be much more planned about in terms of creating them. Here's three intangible assets that I think are going to be very crucial going forward. The first is the capacity to stay productive. You know, if I say to you, you need to be working and your colleagues and your kids, uh, as they grow older, need to work into their mid seventies. The first thing you think is, well, I, I can't work into my mid seventies unless I've got skills that I can use. Uh, and that's really what productivity is about. And that's why I think that a lifetime of learning is going to be so very crucial to ensuring that people stay productive and you have the, the, the ability to stay productive. The second intangible asset I believe is really crucial is vitality. And by vitality, of course, I mean health. You know, one of the interesting things about uh, populations as they get older is that the variance within an age group widens. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're 16 or 17, you're sort of similar to people who are 16, at least physically. By the time you're 70 or 80, the variance is much greater. I'm speaking uh, two days before my son Christian runs the New York Marathon uh, on what he hopes will be a fast speed. I bet you there is an 80 year old running with him. So, and at the same time, there'll be many other 80 year olds who find it difficult to get off a chair. So the variance increases and that's why vitality is so important. Healthy living is so important, but vitality isn't just about healthy living. You know, uh, when we look at people who live long lives, certainly uh, staying productive means they can carry on working. Uh, being healthy, exercising and so on and so forth means that they stay, they stay healthy. But if they want to be happy, we know that another aspect of intangible assets are important. And that's really relationships. Uh, it's, it's very important as people age for them to have strong relationships. That's really, as the Harvard uh, study showed so many years ago, that's really differentiates happy and unhappy people. So the quality and depth of relationships are going to be really important. And that's something that money can't buy. Uh, I teach my MBA students at London Business School. Uh, we, we talk about uh, the new long life and we talk about uh, the future of work. And one of the things that I say to them is, look, if you're 65 years old and you're a billionaire, you can't buy friends. Well, of course you can. But are they real friends, true friends? So, of course, at any stage you can make friendships, but you've got to give time to really encourage and, uh, and build those friendships. The third, uh, third aspect of intangible assets I want to mention briefly is the your capacity to transform yourself. Because... One of the aspects of the multi-stage life is it has many stages of transformation where you're switching from one identity to another, where you're exploring your possible selves. Now, we know from people who make successful transitions in their life that they do it often because they have 
that there's two things that really help them. First, uh, they have some sort of self insight. So they know, you know, that they need to change and they realize that. But more importantly, that they have diverse networks. And by that, I mean, you know, if you spend all your time with people who are just like you, it's very difficult to change or transform because you don't have any role models. So if you look at people who are good at transforming, often they have diverse networks of people of different ages, uh, doing different sorts of jobs. And that gives them a sense of what they, of a possible self. You know, if I, for example, have entrepreneurs in my uh, network, as I actually happen to have, that gives me a lot more confidence about starting my own business as I did 10 years ago. Uh, if, if all my network were academics with no business experience, that would be much more difficult for me to do that. So diverse networks are really important. So where are, are we then in terms of how well corporations uh, and, and society in general is uh, supporting people to make that enormous shift in longevity that I've just described. Um, I don't think we're doing enough. And what I'd like to do today is to make a plea to uh, corporations to be much more sensitive about how age plays out in their, in their companies. Uh, um, and here's a couple of ideas there. You know, to really, for example, change your idea about what it is to age, to realize that older people can be can bring wisdom, mentoring, and coaching into your organization, but also to help prepare people for these new multi-stage lives. And some organizations are doing that right now. Of course, we in I in education have to take some responsibility for that. And I personally would love to see education's establishments like London Business School open up to people of every age. We sort of do that, but I don't think we do it enough. We really need to take more responsibility for supporting people right the way through their life. This is an extraordinary moment for all of us as we move through the pandemic and indeed out of the pandemic. We are without doubt thinking about redesigning work and indeed thinking about redesigning our lives. Let's be sure that as we do that, we realize that one of the most exciting variables is we're gonna live longer. Thank you.